Uh, our next guest is quite extraordinary. I am reading his biography. He is the Secretary of the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet. His name is Martin Parkinson. He has served on the boards of Orica, O'Connell Street Associates and the German Australian Chamber of Industry and Commerce. He also served as a member of the Policy Committee of the Grattan Institute and on the Australian Federal Police Future Directions Advisory Board. He has also served as, the, as Australia's Secretary to the Treasurer. He was the inaugural Secretary of the Department of Climate Change from his establishment in December 2007. He has also worked at the International Monetary Fund on reform of the global financial architecture. He is a member of the Male Champions of Change, which is a tremendous group of men put together by Liz Broderick, and has previously served as a member of the Board of the Reserve Bank of Australia, Chair of the Board of the Australian Office of Financial Management and as a member of Prime Minister Abbott's Business Advisory Council and Prime Minister Gillard's Australia's Asian Century Strategic Advisory Board. He has also served as a member of the Board of Infrastructure Australia, the Council of Financial Regulators, the Board of Taxation and the Board of the Sir Roland Wilson Foundation. He was awarded the Public Service Medal for his contribution to the development of economic policy. He holds a PhD and an MA from Princeton University and he also was awarded the Doctor of University from the University of Adelaide in 2015. So please welcome, after that enormous biog, Dr. Martin Parkinson. Thank you very much for that um, kind, if somewhat wordy, um, introduction. Uh, I'm actually really only 29. Um, I just look like this because of the amount of things I've had to do in, in my limited number of years on the planet. Uh, look, I'm uh, delighted to be uh, back in Adelaide for the second time this week and uh, the third time in three weeks. Um, I was here. I can hear a little bit of um, feedback. Can anybody else hear that? Okay. Okay. Oh, that's better. Yep. Um, I was here on Tuesday with the Prime Minister, uh, and I have to say that um, uh, there's a lot more action uh, in Adelaide now than when I attended uh, high school and university here in the 1970s. Preparing to, uh, to come across to speak to you, uh, <laughs> we spoke to some of the younger staff in the department about Adelaide, and they started talking about rats. <laughs> And I was thinking, rads? Rads? I thought, what are they talking about? Rads used to be drugs. Um, <laughs> people over here on this table, you didn't hear any of that. Um, but it turns out that uh, at least amongst the young people in the uh, Commonwealth Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, and this may say that they don't get out enough, um, but uh, Adelaide is referred to as Radelaide, and uh, shortened to rads for sh oh, well, shortened to rads. Now, um, as I said, I didn't believe this when it was first mentioned. Uh, I was assured it was common, but I have to say, when I've um, walked in and heard uh, Tracy in my room from the Ministry of Sound albums playing, I can assure you, you would not get that at a Commonwealth IPA event. <laughs> so I think rads is probably fair. Uh, my thanks to the Office of the Public Sector uh, and Irma and to the IPA South Australia Leadership Team uh, for inviting me to speak with you at this Gender Equality and Leadership Summit. Uh, what I want to talk about today is uh, unconscious bias and how I think it comes about, as well as talking a bit about some of my own personal experiences in addressing uh, bias. Now, in saying that, I'm going to draw on a lot of my um, experience in, in the Commonwealth Treasury, uh, as I've only been Secretary of PMNC for five weeks and three and a half days. Who's counting? Um, but I'm going to draw on the Treasury because that's where uh, we initiated a major program of change to increase women's participation. 
But I'm also going to draw on my uh, experience as being a male champion of change. The title of today's conference uh, is A Level Playing Field. Um, now, when we talk about a level playing field, I think the first thing to ask ourselves is what do we mean? Uh, I was going to apologise to the non-sporting amongst you for using um, an AFL metaphor, but in fact now that I can see gender equality and leadership, how's that? Um, on the scoreboard, um, I feel a lot less guilty about doing this. Um, what I am guilty about is that I'm an Essendon fan, so I do have a tendency to overthink some of these things. But in the workplace context, a level playing field is an environment that allows every person of merit the opportunity to perform to their best potential. Now, that's great. Um, we can all aspire to that. But what's actually missing? from that as a definition. Uh, overdrawing the sporting analogy, how do our players get on the field in the first place? And I want to come back to that. In any workplace, uh, whether you're a leader, uh, whether you're um, a manager, middle manager, um, whether you're uh, a person um, just starting out in your career, you know that workplaces make decisions. They make decisions about hiring, decisions about tasking, decisions about who is doing well and who isn't. Unconscious bias can come into decision making at any stage. It refers to biases that we are unaware of and which are considered to be outside of our control with our judgments formed by our experiences, cultural environment and background. Now, I actually don't believe that they are really biases outside of our control uh, if we become conscious of them, but at least while they're unconscious, I accept that they're beyond our control. Now, in Treasury, we were trying to understand better why we had comparatively low levels of women in the senior executive. So we had about 20% of our senior executive staff uh, were female, um, and that compared to Commonwealth uh, public service average of about 40%. Uh, so when I became secretary, we set about um, undertaking a systematic uh, review of the department and its culture uh, to try and understand what was going on. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But one of the things that we did is we had a long, we, we took, undertook a long-term analysis of performance results. Uh, and we had you know, we had a long history of performance assessments for every person in the department, and every person at every level was judged uh, against uh, seven separate criteria. And being good nerds, because we were from Treasury, we'd kept all that data and we'd collated it uh, and we were able to analyse it. Now, what we found is that when we selected our graduates, if I took the name of the person off the top of the application, we could not tell on the basis of academic results whether we were employing a male or a female. Really important benchmark. Yet within eight months, we had come to the view that um, our male graduates in most years had far greater conceptual and analytic skills than our female graduates. Now, if you think about it, the day they walk into the department, we can't tell them apart based on any of the criteria that we use. Um, but within eight months, we claim to be able to see a distinction. Now, this is an example of bias in itself. We actually have seven criteria on which we rated people. But over time, conceptual analytic had become the, um, the, the at least commonly accepted as the preferable of the seven criteria. Now, as something as secretary, I completely rejected, but it was deeply embedded in the culture. So now, what I'm saying is that um, I look at your application form, I look at the write-up of you after you've been interviewed, before you've walked in the door, I can't tell 
on paper any difference between the male and the females, but within eight months um, we had come to the view that the males were conceptually and analytically better equipped than the females. What was going on? Well, let's be, let's be frank about this. The average 22-year-old, 21 or 22-year-old male um, is not perhaps the world's greatest communicator. Um, the joke is, how do you tell a Treasury extrovert? He looks at your shoes. Um, <laughs> you know, it's remarkable. The only people who don't laugh when I say that are Treasury, treasury males. <laughs> treasury females think it's hilarious, but Treasury males don't. Whereas your average 21, 22-year-old young woman, very confident, outgoing, um, uh, able to uh, hold a conversation. Now, I'm grossly exaggerating, but, but I'm, I'm doing it deliberately to make the, the point stark. So we had a look at what we were doing with these people when they came in. And it turns out that what we were doing is we were streaming the young women off to the outward facing roles where they had to interact across the department and they had to interact across departments. And we were taking the young men um, and because we didn't think on average they were anywhere near as good as young women at doing those sorts of roles, we were putting them in the back room and doing the, they were doing the techie stuff. Now remember, when the young men and young women come in, they are technically as well equipped, we can't distinguish. That's not so bad, I suppose, except that when we get a few years down the track and we're making the decision whether or not to move them up into the executive level, that is the middle management ranks, the most common thing that I had heard as a deputy secretary and then as a secretary was, she's very good, you know, but we just haven't seen enough of her conceptual and analytic skills. So what were we doing? We were tilting the playing field. We were tilting the playing field away from women. Not intentionally, not consciously, um, but in order as, a, uh, as managers to make our life easier, we were doing some things that were ultimately then having an impact on the ability of young women to progress up the hierarchy four or five years down the track. Not only that, um, uh, when, we, when we started to have this, um, this discussion, uh, we also found ourselves having a discussion about what constitutes merit. And again, I'm going to come, come back to that um, in a moment. So if you think about it, going back to that playing field analogy, the Adelaide Oval, um, we didn't just expect our um, young men and women to come out and play sport, but we're actually expecting them to play two different sports, and then we were going to decide whether they would got to play on the Adelaide Oval based on whether they were playing the sport that the majority of the boys were playing and not, not the young women. Now, as I said, um, across the public sector, we adhere to the concept of merit as the basis for uh, many of our decisions. And along with my male champions of change, uh, we've worked in our own organisations and publicly over the last five years to try and break down the barriers to women's advancement. Only a couple of weeks ago in Sydney, we were looking at how much progress we'd made. Uh, and, you know, it's a good news story. We have made progress. It's a bad news story, though, in that every single one of us felt that we hadn't made as much progress as we'd hoped we would make. And that got us to thinking about um, what was it that was really missing from the way in which we had approached this. Uh, and um, I, I had the strong view that... Um, uh, what was missing was a discussion about what merit actually meant in an organisation. And it was something that in the, my last year at Treasury, we spent a lot of time internally discussing merit. 
uh, and I thought it was it was really important for us because uh, it was to me the thing that was holding us back. But it was really interesting to find my colleagues uh, all saying that maybe we've got to go back and readdress the whole question of merit. Now, as we were having this MCC meeting, Elmer Funke Cooper, who's the um, CEO of the Australian Stock Exchange, who was on the phone from San Francisco, uh, was using his PC to do a Google search on definitions of merit. And the online dictionaries mostly refer to merit as a someone's skill to do the job. And as Elma was telling us this over the phone, it struck us that this was a narrow definition because what it did is it ignored potential. And it reinforced the challenge we have to see talented women on shortlists, talented women to raise their hands for promotion, and talented women getting promotion. So we started thinking about how would we redefine both the word and the concept of merit. And um, Sandra Harding, who's the Vice Chancellor of James Cook, saw the piece that I had in the Financial Review last week talking about merit. And uh, Sandra sent me an email directing me to an article she wrote in 2002 called The Troublesome Concept of Merit. Now, Sandra was looking specifically at the context of merit in academia, but I think her thoughts hold true across society more generally. Now, let me read a quote from Sandra. As it stands, the concept of merit is troublesome as the idea that fair and objective judgments can be made and rewards allocated in proportion to worth to individual merit is at best naive and at worst a deception. Now, for someone like me, who was the secretary of an organisation that prided itself in being a meritocracy, the whole idea that we had to have a debate about what merit meant was quite challenging. It was even more challenging for a lot of my colleagues. But you come back to Sandra's um, conclusion. What did she base it on? Well, she says that our conceptualisation of merit are embedded in a neoclassical economic perspective that values the individual implies, and implies that those who have, quotes, made it have done so solely through their own efforts. If you take that viewpoint, inequality is never a problem. More simply, if you haven't succeeded, it's your own fault. <laughs> Professor Harding instead argues that to judge on merit is a nonsense as not all groups have a chance to be equally meritorious. To be female, non-white and poor is to be at a disadvantage when decisions are made on some supposedly objective merit-based criterion. So essentially what Sandra was saying was that, Martin, I think you're onto something here because we hold on to the ideal of merit in so many contexts and use it to justify so many decisions, but even our view, own views on merit are grounded in unconscious bias. Now, in preparing to, to speak with you today, I, had a, um, I read an article in the Atlantic Monthly recently that reported on some pretty eye-watering data. An MIT professor, Emilio Castur, studied almost 9,000 employees who worked as support staff in a large company. The company itself had publicly committed to diversity and had implemented a merit-driven compensation system to reward high-level performance and to promote the equitable recognition of employees. But Professor Castilla's analysis revealed some startling results. Women, ethnic minorities and non-US born employees all received smaller increases in compensation compared with men this was despite the fact they held the same jobs, they worked in similar roles, they had the same supervisors, and they had the same performance assessment scores. This is what the pay gap is really about. The pay gap is often spuriously um, dismissed because people say, well, you're comparing a predominantly female um, oriented occupation, predominantly male oriented occupation. There's a big argument about trying to make occupations less gender specific, but here you can't deny it. Where people are doing the same job, 
they're getting the same performance assessments, but they're getting paid differentially. Now, that's you know, essentially what they were saying, that unless you were a white man, you had to work harder to receive the same salary increase. Now, that's probably, as I'm saying, a pretty good example of unconscious bias on its own. But what Castilla did next was to look to the company's adherence to the principles of merit. He ran a sequence of further experiments and found that in every organisation they looked at that emphasised its meritocratic values, managers awarded larger financial rewards to male employees, even when female employees had the same performance result. So Castilla concluded that when people think they are objective and unbiased, they are less likely or indeed never going to scrutinise their own behaviour, resulting in outcomes that are decidedly not based on merit. This creates a paradox for organisations that want not only to demonstrate their commitment to diversity, but also want to live up to that commitment. As Castilla noted, this does not mean the pursuit of equality is futile. It does mean, however, that formulations geared toward increasing fairness need to be conceived and delivered in a way that fulfils their intended goal. Now, one of the things that I liked about this article is about six or seven years ago, I actually read a piece in the New York Times that um, was reporting on some academic work being done then. And it said that the stronger the commitment of an organisation to being a meritocracy, the more this was used as a shield to, face, to, to not face up to inherent inequality. When I came to addressing the whole concept of unconscious bias with my colleagues in Treasury, I had this at the back of my mind. And as we worked our way through it and we progressively did a range of things, I kept coming back to this feeling that we had to have a debate about what merit meant. So I'll come back again to that in a moment. One of the key lessons I learned over that period, though, of driving that change in, in Treasury is that if you want to achieve lasting organisation and cultural change, it's critical to secure ownership and involvement from all staff at all levels in an organisation. Without this, reform will fail and will risk being perceived by staff as a tick-the-box exercise. So when I became Secretary of Treasury in 2011, it was clear that we had a problem with recruitment, retention and promotion of women. Yet in the past, we had implemented a whole range of programs to address this. We'd encouraged and supported part-time work, we'd facilitated access to childcare, we'd sent women off onto training courses, we had done a whole variety of different things. But it had, had no flow through, no marked flow through to the representation of women in senior ranks. What was going on? Well, before I'd become Secretary of Treasury, I had been Secretary of the Department of Climate Change. Climate change was created out of thin air. You, know, you all know that when you do a machinery of government change, you take two departments, you mash them together in some way, you cut them in a different way, and you say, lo and behold, we've got two new departments. Um, as ministers, I've done my job, now you get on and do yours. In this case, climate change was, here you go, Martin, here's your department. Piece of blank piece of paper, go out, find everything. Um, and completely inadvertently, I found myself with 12 of my 13 first assistant secretaries, so secretary, deputy secretary, first assistant secretary, 12 of the 13 being female. Not only that, I realised after a while that the level of technical expertise in the discussions and debates around policy was no different to that which we'd had in Treasury. What was different was the style of the debate. And it made me begin to think that what Treasury had done, and which I had participated in as a deputy and as in all the years I'd spent there, 
is that we had basically put in place a whole series of ad hoc responses. In other words, we were putting band-aids on the symptoms and we hadn't got to the root cause of what the problem was. So I'd come to the view that what we needed was a more systematic review of the barriers to women's advancement. And we brought in a third party, Deborah May, um, if you don't know Deborah, I'd encourage you to look up uh, her website and um, uh, have a look at some of her reading, uh, some of her writing. Uh, and I got Deb to come in because I thought we needed someone to hold a mirror up to us. Now, treasuries, whether it's here in the state, uh, any of the other states in the Commonwealth, or treasuries overseas, we're a pretty arrogant bunch of people. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to say, I think Dave, Dave Reynolds has got you guys uh, completely spooked. We're really, we're really, really nice guys and women. But no, look, um, we're, we are intellectually arrogant in the sense that we believe, because of the way in which we, we are trained to think, that we can actually solve most problems by ourselves. This was one where it was absolutely clear there was no way in the blue fit we were going to be able to solve this by ourselves. We needed someone up to hold up that mirror. Um, and that's what we got uh, Deb in to help us do. One of the things that was really interesting is that um, Deb... So Deb kept reporting back to myself and the deputies, uh, so our executive board, uh, as she was going through this cultural audit process. And she burst into one of our meetings one day and said, you'll have no idea what's just happened. And she had been doing focus groups with men and women, all men, all women, um, all at one level, across all levels. And she had just finished the focus groups. And she had done the old butcher paper and texter. Uh, and she gave everybody sticky labels and said, you go and write down um, what you think is the major barrier to women's progression in the Treasury. And then they got them to stick them on the, on the butcher's paper. And she said, in every single case that she did, there was zero overlap between the reasons men gave for women's lack of progression and the reasons women gave for women's lack of progression. Not that there wasn't complete overlap, not that there wasn't just a bit of overlap, there was zero overlap. And when we went through this whole cultural audit process, we came to the view that what we had was not a single problem with a neat, clear-cut solution, but a whole range of subtle, cultural, attitudinal, behavioural issues that were going to take time, continued leadership and commitment to change. These findings were really confronting to us as a senior leadership team, and indeed one of my deputies, Nigel Ray, turned to us and in somewhat a degree of distress said, and this is a quote, we are not leading the organisation we have thought we have been leading. So if you think about it, as a senior manager, you come to the realisation that the organisation that you think you're leading is actually not in the way it behaves. The organisation that actually exists, that is really, really quite confronting. While everyone had a role in tackling this, as CEO, as CEO I had to own the initiative. This is something a CEO cannot delegate. You can't drive this through your HR department. You can't drive it by giving it to your deputies to run. You've got to own it if you want to tackle it. You can't be half-hearted in your commitment. You have to see this as absolutely integral to the future success of your organisation. In short, the suite of strategies we settled on, which we called progressing women, had to be a mainstreamed business imperative for us. And I have to say that 
um, I, I mentioned David somewhat flippantly a moment ago, um, but I think what David's trying to do in DTF is exactly the sorts of things that we um, had to do in the Commonwealth Treasury and more strength to your arm, my friend. Now, a key part of our strategy was seeking to remove the unrecognised recognized biases that had tended in the past to disproportionately impact on women. So they weren't necessarily only gender-specific, but they tended to disproportionately impact um, on women. And we had to do that while ensuring at the same time our promotion decisions were well-founded. We started off with an unrecognised bias awareness program which we rolled out to uh, senior leadership and um, all the mid-ranking staff in the department. And we started at the top. So the deputies and myself were the guinea pigs for the unrecognised bias training. It takes courage and leadership to be open to examine, uh, examining your internalised belief systems and behaviours and then to act to change your own behaviour and to seek, and to seek to recognise and then, importantly, call the biases of others. But if you want to succeed, that's the environment you've got to create. So this comes back to Castilla's paradox of meritocracy is that policies don't just act to address symptoms, they have to instead confront the prejudices or perceptions that create the underlying system. Now, I said Treasury had long had policies encouraging and supporting part-time work, job sharing, and facilitating, practical, uh, facilitating access to childcare. I lied. We had policies, and we'd had them for a long time, but did they encourage and support? No. What we had done is we hadn't redesigned jobs. Um, the onus was on the staff member to seek the agreement of their manager, and the manager's predisposition was that every job had to be done full time because managers were scared of giving their staff freedom. What do we do as managers? We want to control inputs. We talk about how we're so focused on outputs and outcomes, but what do we do? You want to see your staff sitting at their desk. Somebody doesn't, but <laughs> you know, most managers don't trust their staff enough if they're deeply, deeply prepared to confront themselves. Or they don't trust themselves enough to know how to manage um, staff operating more flexibly. So we had policies for part-time work, job sharing, we had a childcare centre in the building, but we had actually also created significant practical barriers to staff taking up flexible work, working arrangements. What was their concern? If I go part-time, it's a career killer. That's it. Staff noted that the experiences of flexible working were highly dependent on the attitude of the individual manager. Staff working part-time, most of whom were women, were often not allocated more complex or highly valued work. Indeed, when we went out and quizzed the managers on this, the managers started by saying, yeah, well, they've made a decision to work part-time. I don't want to make them feel bad by asking them to see if they can take on this bit that might require them to work a bit extra or it's a bit complex and might make their child care or their elder care arrangements or their ability to play sport might make it a bit hard for them for a time limited period. Um, so the managers weren't asking the part time staff whether they wanted these opportunities because they didn't want to make them feel bad about saying no. But if you think about what that was doing we were making assumptions regarding people's aspirations and their willingness to uh, actually be flexible to take on highly engaging but demanding work. And as it turned out, those assumptions were wrong. When we did the financial system inquiry, there's the Murray review into the financial system, we actually ran it out of Sydney, not out of Canberra, and we actually said, this is our first attempt, we're going to open it up to anybody. We had a whole pile of people who up until that point had been working part-time 
and notice I'm using part-time and flexible work interchangeably and they're not, um, who said, I want to go on this. This is a great opportunity, but I'd like the opportunity to be able to manage this in a more flexible manner. So we had people who were working from home. We had people who were working from Sydney. We had people who were teleconferencing in every day. We actually found that it wasn't that hard if you had the right mindset as a manager and if you created and provided the tools for people to do it. And in fact, at the end of this, when we, ass when we assessed it, um, the feedback from staff was that this had been a fantastic experience. Uh, and the people who'd been working part-time found it great. People who had worked flexibly and may not have done so previously found it great. And the managers found it challenging but rewarding and were going to go back into their workplaces and try and use the same techniques. Now, given that these areas that people are being precluded from were the ones that had the high attention, they were also the ones that you're most likely to get noticed by and you're most likely to get other high-profile jobs. And as we all know, that's the pathway to more rapid career progression. So again, here we had something that was acting to restrain women's progression, but which we hadn't actually stopped to think about. Now that experience isn't unique in Treasury. The Human Rights Commission uh, study on pregnancy and return to work found that 49% of mothers and 27% of fathers and partners reported feeling discriminated against um, as a result of pregnancy or returning from parental leave. So what did we do? Well, we, we said we're going to adopt an if not, why not approach to flexible work. Managers were expected to approve any application for flexible work unless they, the manager, could make a business case to their deputy secretary that would explain why it was impossible to do the job flexibly. The onus was on the manager, not on the employee. And turning that around, simply changing that, led to a sharp pickup in the number of people who wanted to work flexibly. So not just part-time, but flexibly. We quickly saw arrangements come out of this that simply would never have been considered. Staff wouldn't have considered it because they would have been worried it, it gave a message they weren't committed and managers would never have been prepared to um, contemplate it. Now, I've already discussed the paradox of merit. Um, I said we had a discussion about what merit was and was not. We had to tackle that issue head on because if we didn't, we were just going to continue the cycle of self-replication. Now, the Commonwealth Public Service appointed its first woman secretary, Helen Williams, in 1985. It then patiently waited another 17 years till we got um, the second current finance secretary, Jane Holton. Treasury, which was established at Federation, took 112 years to appoint a woman as deputy secretary, Jan Harris. Now, while I was very pleased that I was able to do that, it was way too long coming. And don't say this is just because economists are conservative. The first woman to serve on the US Federal Reserve Board of Governors, Nancy Teeters, was appointed in 1978. And indeed, Christine Lagarde had been um, uh, head of the IMF for more than a year before Jan made it to um, deputy. So the question was, how do we get more players onto the field? How do we get more women into the senior ranks? First thing we did is we set measurable targets for female representation. We said we want 35% women in the SES by 2016 and a longer term target of a minimum of 40%. Setting targets is really important. It's not quotas, it's about the creation of a light on the hill. And I said to the staff, you have an obligation here. In a room like this, I said, you, each and every one of you, every year, I am going to report to you on the progress we've made and you are going to hold me responsible. If we are not meeting our targets, you are going to ask me, what am I going to do about it? And everybody said, yep, right, we'll see what happens. Well, 
the 30th of June 2014, remember we started this in 2011, June 2014, one third of our SES staff were female, up from 20% uh, over most of the 2000s. And on the day I left Treasury in late 2014, it was 35%. Now, numbers aren't the KPI, but they tell you that we're at least making some progress. We also targeted recruitment of people whom the organisation may not otherwise have looked at. Their very success when they came into the organisation actually helped us in this discussion about what is merit. How do we go about that? Well, the first thing we did is we said to interview committees, your job is not to sit there and passively interview the people who put their hand up. Your job is to go out and find the best field. And I don't expect you to have 50-50 gender split in the field, but you do have to understand that you are going to be judged on 50-50, if not, why not? That is, if you don't have 50-50, you have to be prepared for the deputies or myself to ask you, what did you do to go out and get the best, best field? And that was really interesting because um, what it did is it actually made interview committees think really differently about the sorts of people who could do jobs in the organisation. Those people came in, they were incredibly successful, um, and that helped change the whole debate. We also became very transparent about data. We put out data on the gender imbalance within the organisation, as well as the measures that we were taking to create a more inclusive workplace. We encouraged staff to be, become more mindful of diversity, uh, diversity generally, gender diversity specifically, in everyday practice. At the end of every promotion round, we provide the gender breakdown on the number of applicants, interviewees and promotees. After every appraisal round, we released a gender split on performance assessments by level, by each of the criteria. And we did the same on every pay point in the organisation. We then simply said to the staff, if you can find a reason to explain these results, that is not actually about gender, we're all ears. And if you can't, then you've got to come on the journey with us. I'll stop there. Um, hopefully, uh, there's enough there to create um, opportunity for questions. I, I do just want to say, though, um, while I've been talking about gender diversity, as leaders, uh, our challenge is to ensure that we have teams that reflect more greatly the cultural diversity of Australia. So it's about cultural background, it's about language, it's about disability, it's not just about gender. Um, Treasury focused on gender because for Treasury it was the key issue, but every organisation is going to be different. It's going to be different in its challenge and it's going to be different in its policy response. Um, but um, happy to take any questions. Can we have this on? Thank you. There we are. We have a question over there. I was going to say, we've got, you know, the head of the Prime Minister and Cabinet's office. God knows there's got to be some questions for you, Martin. Thank you. Thanks, Dad. Um, I was interested in the question about the gender gap and the Oh, one really positive thing. Um, uh, what we what we did is so the department had was structured on five groups, and we said uh, we created this inclusive workplace committee with um, uh, people from different levels in the organisation, which I chaired and we brought in two outsiders. So Sue Varden, um, who many of you here would know, uh, and Rachel Cobb, who was the managing director of um, GE Retail in Australia. Uh, and um, 
what we did is I delegated to that group, even though I chaired it, I said, we're going to make decisions by consensus um, and you are going to be responsible alongside me for the decisions we take as an organisation about how we tackle this. But the really neat thing we did, again, purely by accident, is the department was organised on uh, into five groups and we asked each of the groups to develop their own strategy for what they were going to do in addition to what the department was doing as a whole. And, you know, treasuries are full of, um, you know, competitive people. So all of a sudden, you actually had this process where people were learning from one another and they were looking at what was being done in this group and saying, well, actually, we should pick that up. And they were saying, but they're doing that. We reckon we could get a better outcome if we did this. And in a sense, it was like a mini version of the male champions of change where we've actually worked together and plagiarised one another's work uh, and it's helped all of the organisations move, move forward more quickly. I think that that um, process uh, and, and making sure also that that wasn't run by the senior staff in the group, that essentially it was run by mid-ranking and junior staff um, was really, really important. But I think there were two, two things came out of it for me that were really interesting. Uh, one was we had a um, we had one of our groups um, reporting back to us, uh, and one of the executive level one, so uh, a young man uh, would have been in the organisation seven or eight years, and he said to the entire packed room, he said, uh, "I didn't understand." what the problem was when we started this. And he said, now I do. He said, the problem's me. And he said, and it's not just me. There's now a group, a ginger group in, of, you know, five or six EL1s, EL2s, so the level below SES, in our, um, in our macroeconomic group and we've decided we're going to call one another out every time we, we do something. And, that, and he said, and we're going to act as a ginger group to try and encourage others to do it. I thought that was remarkable in a number of ways. One, the self-reflection. Two, the courage. So the personal honesty and then the courage to say this publicly. The second thing, so I thought that was really positive. The second thing, and this goes to my unconscious bias, um, I'd al also created a, uh, a leadership forum and I had people like Gail Kelly and, and the like come and talk to staff, not, not just women, but talk to the department as a whole, uh, Gail Kelly, Ralph Norris, uh, a wide range of people, a male and female, about leadership. And uh, we were having an inclusive workplace committee meeting and Anne Sherry, who's the CEO of Carnival Lines, um, Anne was just about to um, speak to the department that afternoon. And Anne said, can I sit in your IWC? I'll just sit quietly and watch. I said, no worries. And one of the young women from our revenue group who was reporting back on the work they were doing said, look, Secretary, I've got a real problem that I want to raise with you. She said, I know you're motivated by good intentions, but, you know, you keep rolling these super women up um, to talk to us. And, you know, Gail Kelly, Liz Broderick, you know, look, they're fantastic. And they, you know, you've got a hand Sherry, but, gee, look, you know, I'm, I'm a late 20s, my friends are in the late 20s, early 30s, we're a young kid at home. We can't relate to them. You know, they're not helping us in our day-to-day. -day. And I turned to Anne Sherry, who she didn't know, who was sitting next to me, and I said, Anne, what are you going to do about that? And Anne, Anne held up her speech and tore it in half and said, I'm going to speak to you about my experience. And Anne went down half an hour later 
walked into a room of about 500 people and said, hi, I'm Anne Sherry. Look at me. Look at me. Look at the clothes I'm wearing. Look at the car I drive, the house I live in, the job I've got. How can I relate to you? I said, well, I got pregnant when I was at university. I got a job in the public service, a base grade clerk. I lied to my manager um, in order to be able to duck out to um, manage my um, childcare. I'd pretend I was going to a meeting in another department to take my kid to the doctor. And she just went through thing after thing after thing. And she showed them that, yep, you might be looking at Anne Sherry today, but Anne Sherry on that journey was no different to the other people in that room. And I thought that was very powerful. Can we get a microphone to that man there, please? And there's a couple over here too. It's good to see we're going for gender equality. It's great. Yeah. I love it. Thank you. Uh, it was great to hear about your the cultural change that you led across Treasury. I guess I'm interested in your, your new position about what your vision is in terms of applying a similar cultural change across the rest of Australian public sector. Uh, as I said, five weeks, three and a half days. Um, in case uh, you haven't noticed, um, I've sort of been spending a lot of time on tax, which I didn't expect to be doing. Um, look, I've got... Uh, I, I, I actually think there are some... Uh, the, the Commonwealth Public Service prides itself on the fact that... Um, it's ahead of the private sector when it comes to these sorts of issues. I actually think the Commonwealth public sector collectively is a bit delusional. Um, and I think we, um, we confuse numbers um, and culture. Uh, we had results out um, from the ABS only um, two weeks ago. 60% <clears throat> of the APS are female. Uh, I said at the outset only 40% of SES are female. So the APS might be in a better position than Treasury was six or seven years ago. Um, the APS is not perfect uh, and um, we need to, um, to think uh, carefully about this. Uh, I said though in, in sort of wrapping up that um, the challenge was actually broader than gender. Uh, gender was the issue in Treasury. If you went into Treasury and had a look, Treasury is actually very Asian. Um, we, we are much more reflective of the cultural, uh, of the cultural diversity of um, Australia uh, in a non-gender sense. So if you just look about ethnic background or um, uh, uh, country background. Um, and our problem was gender. When I look across the APS as a whole, uh, I think our problems are more uh, broader than just gender. They're really about cultural diversity. Um, indigenous um, staff uh, are seriously underrepresented. And I actually think there's a real problem if you think about indigenous staff in, in the public service. If you're an indigenous public servant, that's one thing. If you're an Indigenous public servant working on Indigenous issues, my Indigenous staff and 15% of PM and C are Indigenous tell me that they feel that that means that in the eyes of many, they are at a lower level of um, public servant. Now, I have to say, to me, I find that quite confronting because I had no, I'd never thought of it before, um, but I think that's if that if that is the, if that is how they feel, then we have a real issue there, uh, and I think also we've got to do a lot more to ensure the senior ranks of the public service are reflective of the um, ethnic, cultural, and language diversity that um, we see in Australian society. So I think we do have a, a fair amount of work, 
perhaps not as much proportionately on gender as the Treasury required, but I think definitely a lot more in some of these other areas. Uh, so um, I'm just starting now with my Treasury Sec oh, sorry, with my Secretary's Board colleagues, so the collection of secretaries, to um, think about what it is that uh, our objective should be over the next five years. Uh, at the same time, it's also uh, we're also trying to think about what do we need to do to build a better, a higher quality cadre of future leaders. So um, I think we've got a lot to do, and uh, wouldn't pretend that it's going to be easy. But you know, I had no idea when I started the Progressing Women Initiative Treasury in Treasury how it would unfold, and it's been a fantastic um, ex learning experience and journey. And I think we've made good progress and hopefully we can do the same sort of thing in different spaces. Well, once you've worked on our tax, can you just put that as the next priority? Martin Parkinson, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Really interesting.